My name is Earl Willis Jr. and I'm from the Warren County Public Library. Today is February the 1st, 2007 and we're in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And we're going to talk to uh, uh, Mr. Gomer uh, Lesh. Lesh. Uh, we're going to start off today, we're going to, uh, where, were you, where and when were you born? I was born in Buffalo, New York in uh, November 26, 1922. Uh, and what branch of the military did you serve? Uh, the United States, well at the time it was the Army Air Corps. Okay. Uh, why did you, uh, was there uh, any certain reason why you, you, you picked uh, that branch? Yes, there was. In uh, 1942, I was a senior in college, and uh, at the time the draft was going to take uh, many of us. So some of us who were seniors found out about something called the Enlisted Reserve Corps, which uh, if you signed up for this, it said you could uh, uh, graduate in June and uh, then you would become an, uh, be involved in the aviation cadet program, become an aviation cadet. So we signed up for that uh, unfortunately, in February of 1944, they decided they needed us, so we had to uh, uh, take off from where we were to uh, the basic training before we graduated. Okay, okay. Uh, so we, we just kind of answered that question, but uh, did, uh, did you enlist or you were drafted? We did enlist. Okay, you did enlist. Yes. Uh, do you remember anything about your training or your, uh, your boot camp or do you remember anything about that? What sticks out in your mind? The yeah, we, uh, we went to Atlantic City was our uh, basic training post and we were quartered in a hotel on the boardwalk, the Chelsea Hotel. I think it was five stories high and I lived on the fifth story. They would not let us use the elevators. So we had to fall out in the morning and uh, get into formation and they changed the uniform of the day so we had to trot up five stories and change the uniform and trot back down five stories of stairs and uh, fall out in the new uniform and so forth. We did formation marching up and down the boardwalk and uh, those are some of the things I remembered from those days. Do you, do you remember any of your instructors, or what did you stand out to most? Uh, at, that, at that point, there were mostly drill sergeants, yeah. and uh, they didn't impress us yeah. in, in terms of their names at all. Uh, did, did you, can you go into some of your training? Did you receive any specialized training? In the I did. Uh, I, uh, first training I received uh, was following uh, the uh, basic training was in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, a uh, place called Williamsport Dickinson Junior College. We had uh, flight uh, training, uh, ground training, and also 10 hours of uh, pilot training in a, in, a, in a plane that was developed in the world, the Piper Cub and we soloed in the Piper Cubs. From that point we were classified in Nashville, Tennessee as pilot, bombardier, and navigator. I was classified as navigator and uh, in uh, December of uh, 1944 went to navigation school in, uh, at Salmon Field in Monroe, Louisiana. So I had uh, navigation school and uh, graduated from there in July of 1945 as a, as a second lieutenant. Uh, so you like, you enjoy flying. Did you, I enjoyed that. That was did you Did you like, uh, enjoy flying or did you like flying before you went in the military or? I had not flown before I went in the military so it was an exciting new adventure yeah. and I really enjoyed it. Uh, How did that come about that, was that, did they sort of give you some options when you went in about things that you could possibly do, or did you specifically? Well, uh, they did put us in the aviation cadet program, and then uh, in Nashville they classified us, and I failed the one fine point of the eye test for pilot, so they classified me as a navigator, 
and uh, that's how I became a navigator. Uh, how did you How did you adapt to a military life? Uh, did you Did you enjoy it, or just? I adapted to it. Uh, I liked much of it. Uh, since there was no choice at that time, you just went along and uh, tried to stay out of trouble, tried to do your duty, and uh, take care of the, uh, the situations you got into. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about your, your service? Uh, where did you serve? What? I served uh, in the United States in several places. Uh, after I was commissioned, I went to radar school in Boca Raton, Florida for one month radar training. Uh, we lived at the Boca Raton Club, which was a, a plush experience. And uh, at the end of that month, we went to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska for transition training, a very brief time. And at the end of that training, we went to Alamogordo, New Mexico, where we uh, got into B-29s, uh, which was a pretty new airplane at the time. Uh, from there, we went to McCook, Nebraska, where we were staged in, uh, in our crews and uh, did training for several months in McCook. From, from that point, we went overseas and we went to Guam. Okay. So you were, you were in the Pacific Theater? In yeah, the Pacific Theater, right. Okay, okay. Um, uh, can you, would you like to talk about some of maybe the, uh, the missions that you flew on or anything that yeah, well, the, uh, the first place we started out from McCook to uh, uh, Hamilton Field in California and from that point we flew to, uh, to Hawaii, from that point to Kwajalein, a little atoll in the middle of the Pacific and from that point to Guam. As a navigator, uh, that was not an easy uh, situation to deal with because you were flying like 3,000 mile legs and uh, you had to hit these little islands in the Pacific. Uh, but I was successful at that point and we, uh, we got to Guam without, uh, without incident. Uh, in Guam, or from Guam, we uh, flew bombing missions to, over Japan. Uh, I got into, uh, got at, I got to Guam in July of 1945 and so it was toward the end of the war, uh, we flew five, five missions in my crew, uh, hitting uh, oil refineries in Japan. The war ended not with the atomic bombs as some people think. Uh, the bombs dropped on uh, August 6th and August 9th of 1945. But our last mission wasn't flown until the uh, night of August 14th and the morning of August 15th. We knew that the war was almost over because the, all the news that was coming out with respect to the uh, dropping of the atomic bomb indicated that Japan, Jap Japan was about ready to surrender. So on the afternoon of uh, August 14th, we got into our planes uh, with orders to uh, fly the longest mission of the war uh, to uh, Akita in Japan, north northwestern Japan, uh, to bomb an oil refinery there, and that would have been a round trip of 3,800 miles. Uh, we were all ready to take off when a man comes up in a jeep and he says, turn off your engines, you're not going to take off because the war is over. We were delighted at that point, but uh, he came, out, up, came around again about 15 minutes later and he says, crank up the engines again, you are going to take off. So we did take off on this last mission of the war, longest mission of the war, August 14 and 15. On the way back to Guam from over Japan, we learned by radio that the war was over. So you, you flew the B-29, which was really cutting, cutting edge in that time. It was cut, cutting edge. It uh, flew high, flew fast, and uh, was a very stable aircraft. Yeah, do, you, do you remember anything, or do you like to talk about what it was like to fly in the B-29? 
Well, the missions were so long, a traditional, typical mission would be more than 3,000 miles, and that's 12, 13, 14 hours. So it was a tiring experience. Uh, so it's, that's 12, 13 hours one way, correct? No, that, a round trip. Round trip, okay. Yeah. Uh, so that was a tiring experience. And uh, having to be alert all that time was uh, something that uh, uh, you, you had to have concentration. You had to, had to be uh, adept at navigation. Uh, so being in that plane and uh, doing the navigation was a, uh, a serious thing. Okay, so most of the time when you, when you and your bomber was, that was at night, correct? Yeah, we let, uh, took off in the late afternoon, like about four or five o'clock, and returned in the, uh, in the morning hours prior to noon. Uh, would you like to talk, I mean, I, nowadays they have uh, like a night vision and all kind of real sophisticated states. What would you like to talk about in the 40s, how they navigated during the dark? Or Well, you didn't punch things up in a computer and let the computer tell us where to go. We had, uh, first of all, the basic dead reckoning navigation, which is navigation by charts and by uh, calculating the airspeed and ground speed and drift. And that's, the, that's basic dead reckoning navigation. Then we had radio navigation. And uh, since we flew over Iwo Jima, we could set our radios to, uh, to the Iwo Jima station where the, the island uh, was in uh, United States hands at that time. So there was the uh, uh, radio navigation. We had celestial navigation, which means shooting the stars and determining uh, where your aircraft is in, the, uh, in respect to the stars. And then the uh, most accurate and most helpful navigation tool was called LORAN, L-O-R-A-N, Long Range Navigation. There were LORAN uh, transmitters located along the routes uh, off of mainland uh, Asia and off of Guam, and uh, we could uh, take a uh, take a navigational fix uh, from the Loran stations and very accurately determine what our positions were. Uh, do you, you you were talking about Iwo Jima? Do, did you ever land on Iwo Jima? After uh, did you ever? I mean, did you, did you your plane ever land on uh, any of the airfields? We never had to land on Iwo Jima. There were some of our okay. planes that did have to land because okay. of uh, flak damage or because of engine trouble or something like that. Our, our crew never had to land on Iwo Jima. Okay. There was one experience we had after the war, and uh, that was sometime in late August, I think. We had an opportunity to fly over Nagasaki and Hiroshima, where the atomic bombs had dropped at a low altitude uh, to see the destruction of those two cities. And that's uh, an experience that I will never forget because of the uh, total destruction that the atomic bomb uh, devastated on those cities. Yeah, because there anything that you like, to, that, that, I mean, it's, it's hard to, to describe what that looks like. What is it? I know people have talked about it looks like the face of the moon or it just looks, it just, what did it look well, like? My, uh, my sense of it would be that it was simply a flattened city with, with a few uh, structures uh, extending up uh, more than one or two stories. Both, both of those yeah. cities were that way. It was a shell of what it used to be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and do you, do you remember like it was, if it was a couple of weeks or months after they dropped the atomic bomb and she flew over, do you remember that? A couple of a uh, couple of weeks, really, couple a weeks. period of three, three, maybe four weeks. Okay, so it just happened, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you were talking about flak. Now, would you would you like to explain? Uh, did you about about being shot at and they had tracers? Maybe you can explain what the what it looked like for people to shoot up at night, what the tracers were, and everything like that. What would happen would be that the uh, Japanese would cone you with searchlights and then aim their flak uh, at your plane uh, while they were coning you with, with searchlights. Uh, our own crew was uh, again fortunate that we did not get uh, hit 
with the flak to any great extent of damage. Some of our uh, wing aircraft did get it, uh, did get hurt by flak. Uh, we were not. Okay. So did you ever, I mean, you know, they show them like in the movies, they show them like the tracer rounds going up and you can see them. And did you, was it like that? Or? I was too busy at the navigation table to look oh, out and, yeah. and, and try to see that. Yeah. Uh, you, you would hear flak bursts near you. Yeah. That was, that was my experience. Yeah. Is it, it's, I guess it's really, it's nothing you, you can talk about it to experience it, but is it, I mean, when somebody is, is, is shooting at you, it's, it's hard. Is it hard to believe or you just you don't think about it or? When you, <clears throat> before your mission, you were briefed and the briefing officer would uh, give you a description of uh, the location of where flak uh, would probably be. So, because as I say, we were bombing oil refineries, uh, the flak would not be located, the flak guns would not be located right at those oil refineries, but they'd be in the cities yeah. near the refineries. Yeah. Yeah. So you would have an expectation of, uh, of what, to, of what yeah. to find. Yeah. Uh, now I know that the B-29, it dropped bombs, it also it dropped incendiary. Right, incinerary. You had some incinerary runs. Yes. Would you? Would you? Did you ever run any incinerary runs on Japan, or is that something that? That's uh, something not not in my experience. Okay. Okay. I know that uh, I've read before that you know the B twenty nines was for bombing and incinerary runs. One of our. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, incendiary. No, we did not ever drop incendiary bombs. Okay. In, in our wing. Okay. We were strictly involved in, uh, in uh, explosives. Uh, there was another thought I had uh, that I wanted to express uh, with respect to, uh, well, I lost the thought, I lost the track of thought. That's okay, that's okay. Uh, can, you, can you talk about your friends or your, your comrades and you, did you have any like real close bonds with your friends or? We bonded with our crew. Yeah. There were 10 members in each crew. Actually the thought that I had, and I'll circle back to that, was that our bomb wing, the 315th, had B-29s that had been stripped of all their armament except the tail guns. Uh, other wings had uh, turret guns on, on the top, at the top of the aircraft and in the nose and in the uh, uh, waist, uh, which were uh, aimed by radar. But the theory was that we could fly higher and faster uh, than other aircraft and uh, would not be harmed by Japanese aircraft, which would find it difficult to make a pursuit curve upon our planes. So uh, that, uh, that was a uh, uh, part of the experience. Another part of the experience was that we did not fly formation, which made the individual navigator's job uh, a little more serious than just following a bunch of planes that are uh, in, in formation. Uh, let's see. Okay, back up a little. Your friends, the people. Oh, friends, right. Yeah. We, f we had a, a very close bond among the ten persons in the crew. There was a, an airplane, aircraft commander, pilot, a co-pilot, or uh, co-pilot, bombardier, uh, radar operator, uh, radio operator, flight engineer, two scanners, one on each side of the plane where the uh, guns normally would have been, and a tail gunner. So the ten of us uh, formed a, a unique uh, bond and uh, we did a lot of things together uh, while we were off duty and even after the war we kept uh, kept in touch with each other. A sidelight, <clears throat> I, I stayed in the uh, in the reserves when I uh, was able to get out of uh, off active duty uh, until I was age 62 so I got 20 years in my pilot also stayed in the reserves, but he was called back during the uh, Korean War, and he was flying a, uh, a spy plane, B-29, and was shot down over the Sea of Japan. He and his crew 
uh, and there were no survivors. So uh, I consider myself very fortunate not to have uh, had to uh, been not to have been called back during that conflict, and not to have been confronted with another situation where the possibility of being shot down existed. So you said you were a major. Would you like to talk about that? I was at the time. I graduated uh, navigation school as a second lieutenant. I got, I was uh, promoted to first lieutenant before I got out. But then, as I uh, stayed in the reserves, I was promoted to major. So I retired as a major. Okay. Would you like to talk about being a major, or would that? Uh, being a major helped me get a little uh, income during my yeah. uh, late 60s and 70s, 80s and 90s. Uh, being an officer had its privileges. Privileges, yeah. With rank comes privileges, though, what I've heard. You know? Right. Did you, did you, can you talk about maybe the, maybe your, your family back at home or, you know, your, your how did you, did you interact with them when you were? I married my wife while I was still in service. Uh, she was, uh, I met her in Selman Field at, uh, na well, I was in navigation school. She lived in Monroe, Louisiana, and I met her on a blind date, and we dated for several months while I was in navigation school. When I got to Boca Raton, I saw that some of the fellows had their, uh, had their wives with them, and I, I had not thought this was a possibility. But when I saw that, I wrote her a note and I said, Marie, how would you like to get married? And uh, so she wrote back and said, yes, I would. So we went to my hometown of Buffalo and uh, we got married in my parents' house uh, by my grandfather, who was a minister. And uh, he loaned us his Ford Coupe to go to Niagara Falls on our honeymoon. So uh, we had that adventure. And from that point on, she was able to travel with me to McCook and to Alamogordo. And uh, she came back and actually she stayed in Buffalo for most of the time while I was uh, overseas. Uh, okay, uh, well, no, uh, so you said uh, you had to fly one more mission after in late August of 45. So that's where you were at. Where were you at when the, the war ended, World War II? Where was that fun? Where were you at? What uh, were you, um, what, were you still? Uh, I was in Guam at okay. that point and uh, flew that last mission okay. off, off of Guam. Do you, do you remember uh, what it felt like to, to, to finally go home, go to the United States? Or? It was, uh, well, first of all, after the war ended, uh, it was kind of a drag time. Uh, you had to have a certain number of points to be uh, discharged, and I didn't have anywhere near those points. I think it was like 35, and I may have had 25, 28 points. But my wife was about to have a baby, and did have a baby in uh, November of 1946. 45, I'm sorry. And at the same time, my mother was in the hospital for some reason in Buffalo, and my wife and baby were in Buffalo. So I went to the Red Cross and they got me an emergency leave. So I took off in December of uh, 1945 and never had to go back. Okay. How did one get those points to get cycled out? The points were uh, years of service and number of uh, flights. So I had like three years of service and five flights, uh, and I forget how, what points, what counted what, but uh, yeah. that, well, that was the, do you, that was the criteria. Do you remember how many hours you, you flew in combat, how many hours? Well, it would have been uh, five times uh, about 65 hours, roughly. Okay. okay. Uh, do you remember coming home, what it was like? Uh, the, how did the people uh, react, or was it? You know? uh, coming home was uh, was a, a joyous experience. Uh, I was able to fly home. I flew into New Jersey, where I was uh, uh, not discharged, but uh, took uh, took a separation from service, and uh, then 
took a train, I guess it was, back to Buffalo, and uh, the homecoming was a delightful homecoming, especially in view of the fact that I was going to see my new daughter yeah. for the first time. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, did they, uh, so everybody was pretty happy? Was it our lady that it was It was a happy time. Uh, at, at that time, uh, veterans were, uh, were very welcomed and uh, very much appreciated. Okay. Did you have a hard time getting used to uh, civilian life? No. No? Again, at that time, the, uh, the law said that your employer had to take you back if they had a place, uh, place for you. I was a radio announcer in Buffalo before I left for service, and my uh, radio station uh, did take me back, so I uh, went right back to work okay. very shortly. So you, you went from, from flying over Japan to working in working going in back a radio to work. station in yeah. Buffalo. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's a, that's really good. You uh, can you uh, can you speak about maybe how you came to uh, the Bowling Green? What's your connection to Bowling Green and how you live in? Yeah, uh, we lived in Nashville for some 44 years. Okay. And uh, from 1959 plus 44 till almost 2002. And our daughter, son-in-law, live in Bowling Green. Uh, so we, my wife and I, uh, decided to move here in order to prevent them from having to go back and forth on, on the interstate to take care of us in case we got, uh, got ill. So we moved here in 2002. My wife had had uh, uh, surgery and we moved into, a, uh, into the Bowling Green Retirement Village for two years, and then we found a, uh, a duplex over on Riverbend Street and moved there uh, and uh, lived there from uh, 2004 to uh, I moved here in uh, 2014. Marie, my wife, had uh, Alzheimer's. We dealt with Alzheimer's for four years and she finally uh, passed away in 2013. Uh, how did your experiences that you had in your military career, how did it how did it affect your, uh, your, I guess your civilian, civilian life, or did you, did you, is it, did you look at things different, or did you have things in, in uh, put things per, per, you know? Uh, I think it gives one a sense of uh, a sense of order, a sense of uh, being able to follow uh, instructions, a sense of of uh, construction. Uh, there wasn't a lot of carryover professionally, but uh, the, uh, the military experience is one that uh, provides one with uh, uh, a sense that, uh, that you do have uh, order in your life. Yeah, yeah I guess you would, you would, if you, you would put things in perspective. You know, a lot of times today we get mad if somebody cuts us off in traffic, but that's nothing compared to being in combat. That's right. It puts you, it puts you in, in that's face right. perspective, right? Yeah. It makes you appreciate the victim's yeah. life, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you ever think about how your life might have been different if you hadn't uh, served? Say again? Uh, do you ever think about how your life might have been different if you hadn't have served? Uh, no, because it was so normal at the time. Uh, Going into service was just one of those things that uh, that one uh, just about had to do at the time if one was healthy. Yeah. Did you know a lot of other people that went into service during that time? Yes, uh, in our uh, group at, in, of seniors at, uh, at college, uh, there were about a half dozen of us who joined this enlisted reserve corps program. Uh, I see your your badge over there. It says. Oh, yeah. Would you like to talk about that? You you have a you have a badge over there that says yeah. Let me, that that was yeah. Uh, that was a a, a visit in uh, about two or three years ago to the uh, to our reunion, our bomb wing reunion in New Orleans, Louisiana. And one of those badges uh, 
reflects the uh, fact that we visited the World War II Museum, which is a, an exciting experience in New Orleans. Uh, every, every year uh, we had a bomb wing reunion. I was never able or uh, available to attend them. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, about a couple of years ago, the uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, reunion was in uh, Connecticut, in uh, Madison, Connecticut, and so I was able to attend that one. Uh, at the same time, I was able to visit my sister who lived, my only sister who visited, lived in Madison, Connecticut. Uh, but uh, I attended that one and then this one in New Orleans where my daughter and son-in-law uh, traveled with me. Okay. Yeah. How many guys are left now in, in that unit? I'm sorry? Uh, about how many people are left now? In, in my uh, very few. As a matter of fact, the bomb wing, which consists of four groups, uh, had so few people uh, still living that the, uh, uh, the reunions became uh, the uh, bomb wings of the Marianas, not just our bomb wing from Guam. Uh, of my crew, only one individual, the co-pilot, was living as late as a year ago. And he, he lived in uh, New Mexico and passed away about a year ago. Uh, but prior to that, they all dropped out one way or another. Uh, is there anything that you would like to, to say to future generations or people that watch? What would, what would be the, your most important thing that you would like to say about this interview? I think the important thing to say is that I'm thankful that, uh, that I have been uh, left to uh, discuss this kind of thing. I'm thankful that, uh, to have lived this long and appreciate the fact that I've lived this long and hope that uh, future generations will look back and uh, uh, be grateful for what it was that we did uh, to help uh, bring this country into a victorious situation in World War II and subsequent uh, veterans in subsequent uh, conflicts. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I'd just like to say that uh, I feel very honored to interview you and I appreciate your service. Yeah. It was my privilege. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so, at uh, the end of this, uh, if, so would you like to just that more or less, that's your, you just want us to uh, understand how much sacrifice of, of, that you've... Well, I didn't consider it really a sacrifice. It was a duty. A duty. I did it. And I'm thankful that I came through it. Yeah, yeah. I think what you, what I mostly take out of it is when you, when you talk about being in the military, then it was just you, you it was something you, you did, and it wasn't a question where you were and weren't going to do it. You were going to do it, and you was just going to make the best of it and, and serve your country. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's the most I get from people exactly. I've talked to in your generation. Right. It was something you did, exactly. and there's no question in your mind. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. It was an honor to Thank you. interview you. Thank you. Thank you.